welcome to Interviews in Cal's Closet here on CFTA 107.9, where today I'll be speaking with singer-songwriter Patrick Murray. This program is being sponsored by Amherst Auto Supply, your local Napa auto parts store, located at 63 South Albion Street. Patrick and I are going to talk about his background, when he became interested in music, his influences in the industry, an early stage appearance, when he began writing and what he used for inspiration for his songs, when he hopes to turn music into a career, and much more, including talking about and playing some of his songs. I'll be your host, Cal Lewis. Please sit back and enjoy the show. The following interview was pre-recorded at Studio CAL in Halifax. Pat, I'd like to thank you for taking time out this evening, coming down and doing this interview with me. You're welcome. And to start things off, could I get you to give us a cut off your brand new EP? Yeah, I'd say Hey Baby would be a good one. Where did you come up with the song? It's about somebody, but uh, we're no longer together, so I guess the I'll admit it used to be like Hey Christine, just an old girlfriend who was going through like a hard time, and I just came up with a song. And of the whole album, it's probably the one that's been the most popular. It's definitely from the heart, because like, I was thinking of her at the time, and Since then, we've been broke up, so it turned into Hey Baby. Baby, don't be so sad Better days are coming Yeah. 
Well, I was born in uh, St. John, New Brunswick. I was brought up there. My parents got divorced when I was really young, when I was two. So for a good portion, I didn't really have a dad. Then my mom got remarried to my stepfather, who now I don't get along with. And anyway, we moved out to Quispamsis, which was a beautiful area, like Kennebecasis Valley. And uh, I actually mentioned it in the CD because uh, there was a, a writer's weekend that I did in high school. And it was like government sanctioned. I don't know if it's federal or provincial, but all these kids from school, there's about six or eight of us that got to go on this writer's weekend. And it was like a combination of people who wrote for the school newspaper. And then uh, I think I was the only one that didn't write for the school newspaper. And it was basically workshops centered around like creative writing, like taking photos. There was uh, this artist Freeman Patterson I think was his name he's a photographer and he showed us like all these photos that he took and it was just interesting because you know this guy would take like thousands of photos and a lot of them were really good but you know he would always like pick one or a few and he explained like his creative process and anyway the whole weekend was just amazing there was like a doctor Roberta Lee she was like from UMB SJ and she actually went to the church that I went to and I always loved her and I had no idea she was an English professor until, you know, she was there. And it was from there I, I learned to write just what's on my mind and how I feel. And a lot of times, a lot of the songs just come like that. And I've never had a problem if someone gives me a subject to write about or especially if something has like emotional kind of, you know, I just wrote a song that I blogged about, my first ever video blog which was a bit of a challenge because it's the first time I ever did anything like that. But I did it as if it was live. And on that song was is called Davy Boy because it was David Shea. He just passed away. He had uh, autoimmune deficiency. You know, he got sick a lot. Near the end, he went into the hospital and then they found out that he had lung cancer. So fortunate or unfortunate, it was quick. But he had been in pain for most of his life. And I knew his wife, Doreen, like really well. They're both from Newfoundland. And uh, I met them, you know, years ago at a campground, like down the South Shore, the Evans. And anyway, that's where I wrote a new song that's going to be on the next album. <laughs> but I just love to write. And sometimes I pick a song, like I decided to write a song about Canada, like how great it was. That's had some online, a lot of people like that. And, and strangely enough, a lot of Americans and a lot of people who aren't from Canada say my favorite song is that Canada song. I was like, it's pretty cool. When did you first become interested in music? I first became interested in music, I think when I was forced to try to put a violin in my hand. I think I was in like grade two or three or something like that. And we had this music teacher who would come I think once a week we had this class and she was fitting us, you know, with different instruments and she gave me a violin and it just was so awkward. I was like, what am I supposed to do with this? You know, I was just a kid from like the south end of St. John, like a tough kid. She's like, here, give me that. And then she gave me like, some verses to sing. And she's like, yeah, you're a singer. <laughs> so like after that, I somehow got enrolled in the Rotary Boys Choir and I did that for a number of years and I made a couple TV appearances as a kid with the choir and you know different shows and that's kind of what got the singing bug going you know when I was a kid and then it just kept building momentum singing church choir and then the show choirs that we had at school and then you know I had a stint playing cello for about four years and it was so weird because 
I played everything by ear. Like I tried to learn the notation, but it just just kind of went over my head for some reason. And even now, I know notes and I know chords and stuff like that. But music theory is not my A plus. I don't play multiple instruments, but I do have a very strange knack to be able to write a song and to be able to put chords to it. And sometimes the words come first, sometimes the chords. There's no process. I leave myself open to whatever. And it's worked out so far. I mean, my first CD, people were gracious enough to allow me to play on TV with it. And, and Tom Bedell played a couple times at Route 104. Because let's face it, there's a lot of talent in Halifax, like a lot of talent in Nova Scotia. And to be noticed at all is good and even Stephen Cook wrote about the CD and had good things to say about it and I guess one unique thing about me is I've been in the military for 21 years and I'm looking to get out in the next few years. I've done my time, I, I gave most of my youth to the military so now I'm going to move on and pursue music more, probably be a lot more political which I haven't been able to be, and probably still going to have a day job. But eventually, if I can write songs for an artist, or if all of a sudden I'm nominated for Juno and win it, I might decide, oh, maybe I should do this full time. <laughs> can you remember your very first stage appearance? Yeah, I guess my first stage appearance was in the Rotary Boys Choir. It was a Christmas thing, and it was in St. John High School. And I just remember it because uh, there was all these different choirs, adult ones, and there was us, and we sang some songs, and then we all came on the end. I don't know if it was Silent Night or... I was just a kid. It's hard to remember sometimes, but I remember that because that was a lot of fun. I mean, I was just going where they told me, you know, told me to go, but I really enjoyed it. Who were your biggest influences when you started doing stuff on your own? Oh, man. These are all tough questions. I'd have to say... As far as inspiration, anybody who can sing a note, <laughs> for me, anybody who can write a lyric, because I like people from Stan Rogers to Metallica, and there's country I like, there's R&B I like, there's rap I like, but I'd say the biggest influences would probably be the standard Bruce Springsteen, really like Bruce's stuff, and Stan Rogers would be another one for sure, Blue Rodeo would be another one. Some of the most fun I had working on the next album is one of the songs is going to be a cappella. It's going to be myself and a bunch of other singers. Like right now, it's just me and overdubbed. But it's called Rolling Fields. It's on my Reverb Nation website at Patrick Brian Murray. That's my favorite because I'm talking about what it was like to grow up in New Brunswick, having to leave, and then always yearning to go back. When I get out of the military, I wouldn't be surprised if I uproot and go there. But I'm also tempted, you know, I have friends that are in California because I spent about four years out west in Washington State. I really like the weather, that it's warmer. <laughs> I don't necessarily like the earthquakes, but, you know, strangely, I put some feelers out there for my music and called different venues and stuff, and they're quite receptive to have me to play there. When I first released Losing Set Ashore last year, I had a band, and it was always challenging to keep things up because, I mean, when it's your own music, people have an interest, but it's hard to find. A lot of times, all the good people are just so busy that you can't get them, so you grab who you can. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, and I always found it challenging to keep a band together, and then my job took me away most of last year, pretty much July on. I was going nonstop with music pretty much from April to June. I even did some shows when we went away down in Florida, paid shows, and some places in the Caribbean and Bahamas. So, you know, really nice, nice spots. And like everywhere, if I think about playing somewhere, then I call them up and I, I book it. I, that's one thing with my music career. I don't really limit myself if I think it, I do it. If I think putting for Coldplay is a good idea, I have messaged them. <laughs> they said just send a video, but life has been so crazy like this year. This year has been a songwriter's dream, I guess, because I'm getting divorced. What else? There's a lot of things that are on the sideline that are going on right now. And I don't know that I've had a lot of material and a lot of inspiration to write about stuff. So 
It's funny, when the bank account is red, you turn to music because you can't afford anything else. <laughs> Can I get you to introduce another song off there for us? Yeah, sure. I guess the next song would be Rambler. I actually wrote that song after watching The Wrestler. I don't know if you've seen that movie, but my God, it was really good. And I, I just thought of uh, what it was like to live by the seam of your pants and just have no rules and just give it. And that's where the ramble came from.
when did you start writing your own music and what inspires it? Oof. I started writing my own music, I think, as soon as I got a guitar. Back in 90, 93, when I joined the military, I got a guitar and it was like a Yamaha classical. It had a very nice sound. And I, I bought this book, uh, I forget the name of it. Anyway, it had chords and stuff and basic songs like Where Have All the Flowers Gone and, and uh, House of the Rising Sun. And it taught you different finger picking patterns, it get a little bit more complicated as you went through it. But that's kind of when I started writing. I didn't have the best childhood growing up because of my stepfather. I used writing, sometimes it'd just be poetry, sometimes it'd just be songs. And I got in the habit of starting to, back when cassettes were king, I recorded, geez, on probably like 10 cassettes total, all these different things. If I was inspired to sing, I just sang. And like a lot of the stuff at the time was very dark. And, you know, it took me, I think, until I was in my 30s to finally move on from that stuff and able to sing more joyful things like Hey Baby. Like all the songs on the CD are pretty upbeat and Losing Sight of Shore. I wrote that on the stairs of a church actually in Prospect Bay. When my songwriting exploded, I'd have to say it was 07, 08 because that's when I had to deal with something in the past and head on. I confronted somebody about it and it just, I mean, work-wise and everything, it kind of sent me in a tailspin. But I wrote about 30 songs, like in a very short period of time. And out of that came like Losing Shed Ashore, Hey Baby, Goodbye My Friend, It's Saturday Night, Rambler, Canada. They all kind of came in that time. And I started recording it in 08 at the Echo Chamber with Charles. It started as one song. I was like, I just want to record this song. And then it just quickly picked up momentum and speed. And eventually I had an EP. And I'm very proud of it. This first thing I ever produced in my life. So there was a times where I felt a little overwhelmed. <laughs> but there was other times when Chuck was, yeah, yeah, I got it. Like, I would say, we need to edit this here in this way. He's like, you got it. <laughs> so it's strange that the skills that I developed in the military, which is I do a lot of analysis, like I'm sonarman, but hearing is a big part of that. And it's amazing that you know, I'm able to translate that stuff into studio. And even, even when I'm writing a song, it's natural to me now, but, you know, apparently not everybody thinks that way. So <laughs> when you went in to do this recording, are these the six songs that you had planned on doing at the start of things, or did you make some changes? I wrote a couple. Losing the Shot of Shore was probably the first one. And then I think Hey Baby might have been the second they're pretty close to each other and then goodbye my friend came when my friend had passed away it's saturday night was a product of when they were looking for that hockey night in canada theme like i decided to write a song so <laughs> i knew it wasn't necessarily going to win but that's where that came from but rambler was came after i started recording so Pretty much all of them were either in my mind at the time or soon after a recording. And it just filled up. I think there was other songs that I was thinking about doing, but I was just like, well, if I'm inspired to write these right now, and they just kept getting better, I was like, I'll go with these. I mean, the other songs that I have are really good, and I haven't recorded them yet other than demo, but a few of them I didn't record. But it's funny because I played at the Timberley Beverage Room one time and played this song. I think it's called Crossroads or something like that. And I finished playing the song and I asked like one of the bar owners, his name was Slim. I was like, hey man, what do you think of that song? He's like, oh, it's really good. You know, I think I've heard it on the radio. <laughs> and I was like, yep, yeah, you heard it on the radio. <laughs> so that was kind of, since I started music there's been i'll tell you a couple stories like that was nice to hear and then i played a show in newfoundland and it was near the end of the night and i was kind of tired and it was an okay crowd and a guy was leaving and as i was taking a break or packing up he came up to me and said from the time they turned off the radio to the time you started to the time you stopped i couldn't tell when the radio was off and i'm wow man you know thank you <laughs> There's been that, and I've traveled a lot with the military and sometimes done some R&R, &R, 
and one of those places was Las Vegas for a little bit. And I remember late at night seeing this street performer, and I was with a friend. We just went up to him, said hello, and, and I mentioned, hey, I do this back home, you know, more than just playing around. I actually do shows, and he had this uh, guitar. It just had a frame. It sounded exactly like a classical. It was mic'd up and amped up, and just beautiful sound. And I was like, wow, can I play that? And he's like, yeah, sure. And I don't know if, again, if he thought I'd sucked. You know, after I played the first song, I think it was a new song, the Hawaii song, and he's like, wow, man, that's really good. He's like, who wrote that? And it's like, me. <laughs> so what was even more amazing, you know, I played a couple more songs, and he's like, keep going. Because he was a street performer. Somebody dropped money. In the case. <laughs> yeah, and he was just cracking up. He's like, there you go, there you go. While I was playing, he told a friend of mine, he said, man, I've been playing music for years, and years ago I studied under all these classical guitarists, and I was going to be signed to Universal. And he said, because of the publishing contract, giving up his rights, he said, no way, I'm not doing it. And it had been 14, 15 years since he did any original stuff. And he's just basically living paycheck to paycheck and doing covers. And he told my friend that after I heard Pat playing, I want to start writing again. My friend told me that afterwards. I don't know if it was at that time or right afterwards, but they told me what he said. And I was like, wow. There's nothing more rewarding to me than inspiring someone else to write, especially somebody who was really good. And I think his name was Xavier or something like that. And he wasn't on Facebook or nothing. And it sucks because he was such a nice person. He was in his 40s. And it was definitely a magical moment. I just love it when things like that happen. If you could go back in time, is there anything you would do differently with your music? Oh, these are tough questions, Cal. I would try to learn music theory better, but I don't know if I would learn it. <laughs> it's just one of those things, like music theory has always been, because uh, even when I was in studio, Charles said, you know when something's not right. It's just you don't know necessarily how to say it in music speak. We all say, slow down the tempo, instead of saying, oh, it's 4-4, four, four, it's 3-4. I don't speak that musical language and and sometimes like when someone's really technical it's very hard to explain to them through feelings what you want <laughs> so i think that's the only thing that i would change what uh, surprised you the most thus far with the music i don't know if it surprised me i'm not trying to sound cocky or put the sunshine somewhere but i've always believed that when i was writing this stuff because people were telling me to i always believe it was good and having more than my mom say it's good is very rewarding. And I don't seek other people's praise or approval, but when you get someone like Stephen Cook complimenting you about your CD, or Tom Bedell, or people that are established in our industry, that is probably the most rewarding, is knowing it's not just me singing in the shower, or it's not just me singing at home it's made flash or made whole it's something that nobody can erase it's part of history now and i'm just going to keep writing keep making my own history and the biggest reward i get i try not to focus on other artists because i know there's a lot of talented people out there i just focus on my fans i must have something worth saying and people want to hear it and it's all fresh it's all from me i would love for one of these days somebody it just tickle me pink, I'm sure. Anybody, any musician like Joel Plaskett or when a musician covers your own song, I mean, that's the greatest compliment. And that'd be cool if that happened. I'm going to start a sentence and I ask you to finish it for me. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about... Eating? <laughs> What's the biggest accomplishment you think you've made so far? My biggest accomplishment... I think playing at Riverfest was really nice. It was my first festival, like ever. And I met a lot of good musicians, and there was a lot of good things that spanned off of that. And it's been a hard year for me, and just to be able to find like-minded people. Because I've approached a lot of musicians, and they're always like, yeah, yeah, let's do something together. And then when you talk to them again, it's like a stone wall. 
and it's been very nice. I don't want to look at other musicians as competition. I just don't see that as a good thing. And when I can find musicians who want to work together and collaborate, that's to me, it's about community. It's about being together, helping each other. I'm very much like that and very honest and down to earth, rural country boy kind of guy. I'll lead that into, I found out that my great grandfather and mother are from Amherst and also my grandmother was born in Amherst so I had no idea but there's definitely a connection to Amherst within my family. They were Miglashan so it was kind of neat to find that connection. Losing sight of shore, yeah. what, what exactly is that about? It's actually about suicide. Thinking about you going through a hard time and, and you lose sight of uh, what's important. And it's really about realizing that in the end you see your reflection and then you realize that things aren't as bad as you think. So part of this album was written when a friend of mine was still alive, Harry Bishop. And he, he didn't kill himself, but he, he died on a motorcycle. And during this tumultuous time for me with 07, 08, he was definitely a strength. And I thought of him when I was writing it, and it was all written on that church in Prospect Bay. I was in the parking lot, and I was looking out at the bay, and just all came out. I think it was in one sitting, just boom, <laughs> and it was there. We're losing side shore Off the ground banks of the door Have you done any recording with anyone else? Either backup singing or... 
Adam Baldwin, uh, he sung on, uh, I think it was Hey Baby, and also Rambler. I mean, he's pretty well known in Halifax now. I think he's still Matt May's keyboardist. And he's got a very unique voice, very deep, raspy kind of voice. And he seemed to compliment a lot of these songs. I mean, I tried a couple times to get him to come out to do a show, but, you know, he's just too busy. <laughs> I mean, is you recording on oh, someone else's? I would like to, but I haven't received the call. <laughs> I tell Chuck all the time, like, I'd love to collaborate. And I mean, I, I don't want to just deal with anybody as well. But like, if it's a quality kind of CD, for sure, like without a doubt, like me and I don't know if Jen Miller was here, but we've talked about doing like a duo together. Actually, my friend died, but I was thinking about writing a song with a duo in mind with her voice, because I mean, she's She's a very talented artist, and I got to speak with her and a couple other artists uh, at Riverfest that I played this year. And it was nice, because we talked about doing some songwriter circle kind of shows in Halifax and at some churches and stuff, and we're still in the works of trying to get those together. But, you know, for me, the most enjoyable part of music is playing to an audience that wants to be there and... I find myself slowly pulling away from bars and doing house concerts or doing churches. I guess some wholesome places. I mean, the bars are still good. I mean, you still get, if it's a busy area, you still get people coming in and, and going. But, you know, once a house concert, all those people are there to hear you and you connect. I'm a rural boy, so I like to connect with people one on one. and. And I said to a friend of mine, Lisa Como McDowell, she plays for Brazen, and I was saying, I'm just so frustrated about online sales, and I can't seem to sell anything like online, but when I do a show, people buy my stuff when I talk to them. And she's like, that's a very good problem to have. <laughs> yeah, it's much better than the other way around. Yeah, I guess it's more personal. Even the video blog that I did yesterday, it quickly went to like 100 hits, and I didn't expect that at all. I thought, uh, maybe I'll get like 10, 20, but I believe music is, is an expression, and I believe that in this time of my life, I have something to say, whether it be music or uh, my goofiness uh, coming out. I love talking about myself. <laughs> I don't know if you noticed. <laughs> or even when you're doing a show, I just love it. I told a friend of mine back when it was like Patrick Murray and the Contenders last year, I told a friend of mine, like, I like everything about it. I, I love about music, like setting it up, doing the sound checks, packing up the gear. He's like, packing up the gear? I was like, yes, I just enjoy it. It's such a, I don't know, I like I just, he's like, well, then you can pack up. <laughs> I was like, no, it doesn't work like that. Would you say that your music falls into any one certain genre? Stephen Cook said roots pop, I think he called me, and I've had people say folk rock. I don't try to steer towards any genre. I find the easy listening kind of stuff comes out of me. Like I said, I listen to a lot of different music, but that's the one easy listening. But I recently wrote something that's very bluesy, rockish, so called Karma. And I think in the next few weeks, I'm going to blog about it because I do paid shows and charity shows and stuff like that. But occasionally I will still show up in an open mic just for fun, just because I just like going somewhere and just letting loose, having a few beer, because that's really where all of the music started for me. I started playing my own music back in 07 and 08 when things were challenging. I started going to open mics at, well, it was then the Copper Penny, and now it's the Lower Deck. But Maurice O'Coin of the Persuaders used to be the one who would head that up. I think it was Thursdays or something like that. But there was a lot of bands that would come in, like Dress to Kill, Easy Rider. There was a lot of bands that would come in and just kind of relax. And I kind of liked that because you would get to talk to them about different things, about the business. Like last week, Wednesday, I was like, I'm going to go out to an open mic and just play a couple of my songs. And these people had no idea who it was. And sometimes I just like getting up because people are like, oh, this guy sucks. And then play and they're like, wow, he's really good. <laughs> so, And I played that new song, Karma, and everybody was freaking rocking. It was electric. I knew this song was probably the best that I've written so far. 
and I'm pretty sure that you know it's going to be on the next EP or next. I would like to make a long play kind of CD next, but it's all about money. And I was going to apply for a grant this fall, but I've just got too many other things going on right now, and all those things will clear hopefully by December, January, and then I'll probably have more time to focus in the new year on the album. Can I get you to introduce one more song for us? Sure. The next song would be Canada. So who doesn't like Canada? (laughs) And you say that was written just because... In the year where things were challenging, the war in Afghanistan was going on, and I just wanted to write something about Canada because, you know, we live in a very beautiful country and there's so many good things about Canada. No matter where I go, Americans, people in Europe, even people in the Middle East love Canadians. So I just wanted to write an anthem and I'm still in talks with some choirs. I know that Halifax Cantata, is that what it's called? They're affiliated with the orchestra here in Halifax. Talk to the guy who coordinates them and he's interested in the song but they're just too busy right now but if i get a choir on there i'll finally have achieved exactly what i want i mean this is pretty close i'd say it's like 80 85 maybe 90 but i've always wanted a choir on that song and it gives me chills down my spine to think if i had a choir so i want a choir From ocean to ocean From sea to sea It is our hope It is our dreams From the prairie dog To the beaver's bar And all creatures between From the founding days To our modern way and the sunrise is up on the Atlantic shore and set with the wind on the Pacific storm the Rocky Mountain side the Great Divide the planet's open plains from children's trails Yeah. 
where would you like to be with your music in five years time where well i think california is going to be one of the places i would like to have an lp done i have pretty ambitious goals it'd be nice to win an ecma and stuff like that but i'd really like to win a grammy or or you know no offense to music nova scotia but i don't want those awards i want i want the big ones <laughs> And uh, some friends think I'm crazy and others think, go for it. With your music, do you know if it's getting much airplay anywhere? CKDU, Q104. Lately, though, radio play tends to go along with shows or if you're doing press for them. Like community radio, I've probably had a lot of play, but it's hard unless you pay for time to break into the big radio stations because, let's face it, I don't have a budget like Universal or you know, all these record companies. And as much as I hate to admit it, I mean, it's driven a lot by big companies. But where I've been able to play and get in on it, like I said, Tom Bedell was gracious enough to play my music several times. Like CBC is always a good one. Like Stan Crew is awesome. If I have any shows, I mention them, and he always plays Goodbye My Friend. Which is fine. It's cool when you make a CD and everybody tells you the one they love the most because it's always different. When you went in to do the recording, was it what you had expected it to be when you walked in the door or did you have any type of expectations? When I walked in the door, I wanted to record one song and I didn't know what to expect really because I'd recorded stuff on my own like BR600, which is like a basic digital recording. I'm going to go in studio and see what it sounds like. And I was just... The first acoustic tracks and vocal tracks of Losing Side of Shore, I was blown away by my own voice. I was like, man, you put reverb on that. And I don't know what Charles Austin at Echo Chamber did, but he worked some magic just tweaking things and made my voice sound even bigger. And I know I have a good voice, but having a good sound engineer just makes it so much larger than life. That blew me away from all the recordings that I did on my own to having somebody professional go and record it. That was huge. And when I got talented musicians to play on each track, you could tell the quality and the caliber of their musicianship. And it really showed up. I did my best to coach people along. And for the most part, I work best with somebody who's down to earth and who's flexible. Like, if you're not flexible and not down to earth, it doesn't seem to work as well. Because I've had people that go in there like A-type personality and want to do their own thing. And I don't think music is that rigid. And to me, it's like a spiritual experience. Like, it's an emotional experience. And you got to be open to that when you're playing. Because that, to me, some of the best music is some of the most emotional. Some of the best performances you see. And the performer, you could tell that they feel it that really translates onto music when you're recording when somebody has that frame of mind of just being open and wanting to give that emotion it really shows up you're talking about having an artist on who all is on the cd with you uh well there's myself there's brian zinc did a lot of acoustic guitar and also the bass he's an amazing bass player and when it comes to acoustic guitar brian can improvise like a lot of solos and I remember seeing him at an open mic and I was like, I want this guy on my CD. And he did some great solos on it. Like, hey, baby. Chuck said that Brian would always nail the freaking timing. There was him. There was Rob Crowell of Deer Tick before he did Deer Tick. He used to do a lot of seahorse and a lot of jazz. He was very good on the saxophone and on keys. He was on a couple of tracks. Seamus Erskine, he did a lot of the electric solos and electric guitar. He's just a phenomenal guitarist, and he's young too, so he was another. And all I know is this drummer, he's Ryan Cook's drummer for a long time. Wayne Collins, that's who it is. Some of the other people that contributed were Jay Andrews on percussion, Mark Curry, Losing Sight of Shore, he did the Boran, and Roy McLaren, we had bagpipes on uh, Losing Sight of Shore as well and also on Goodbye My Friend. And Darren Costello did accordion on Goodbye My Friend, and then John Boudreau, he did a lot of different piano tracks on Canada. And a couple of times I remember hearing these guys play. Whenever they hit it exactly, I was like, yeah, yeah, that. It was fun feeding off each other. 
We live in a very McDonald cookie cutter society when it comes to musicians. I find it's easy to find session musicians, but sometimes it's a lot harder to find people to play with on a consistent basis. Just because uh, sometimes people are driven, well, they want to make a steady amount of money, especially if you're doing it full time. You know, fortunately, I got to pick and choose the musicians I wanted and that were at the right price. I mean, Chuck has a wealth of people that he knows to come in. Without him, man, there's a lot of things that would not have happened. I was so thankful. Of all the studios, he was the only one to respond when I was saying I was coming with an EP. I hit a wall of silence with every other, well, the ones that I thought I wanted to record with. And he made the experience a lot easier. And there was a couple of times where I was like, I feel nervous. The very first time I went in, I said, don't worry about it, man. Just act natural, like you're singing in the shower. And, and Chuck is probably the greatest person to work with if you're doing it for the first time or, you know, second, third, or more times. He's very easy to get along with. And he's like a very kind soul. And I'm fortunate enough to be able to record with him. And we have a lot of fun when we're recording. And he is a fan of my stuff. Like, he really does like a lot of the songs and even now the demos that I've done we're excited to take things to the next level and for me the next level will be I will get a producer on the next album just to have somebody to kind of guide the ship I don't mind doing it but I'd rather focus on other things like putting out the best performance that I can and I'll still be there but it's nice to have somebody who counters what you say or you don't want someone always saying yeah that's great that's probably the worst thing you want. <laughs> then it really is only your mother likes it. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything that I've missed that you'd like to talk about regarding your music? I guess all I'd like to say is if you wanted to follow me, I mean, I'm on Twitter, Patrick B. Murray. I also started up a YouTube channel. You can just find me by Googling me. I have a website in the works, but temporarily I'm, I'm just on Reverb Nation, Patrick Brian Murray. And I'm available to do house shows and I'm huge on charity. I love helping other people. Some of my most favorite events are the charity ones, especially when people are so appreciative of what you do. And any charity I can get involved with, because I mean, it's just something close to my heart is helping others. I mean, my mom taught me right. She taught me to help others. You got to help yourself first, but it's important to help others. Can we get one last song in to carry us out for the evening? Yeah, sure. I would say... Goodbye, my friend. It's a bit of a sad song, but it's one I wrote about my friend Harry Bishop. Stan Crew likes that one, so I hope you do too.
a summer's day in proud Newfoundland. I wipe my tears all the way. And I remember, I remember what you say. Live with passion every, every day. Pat, thanks for coming in. Yeah, my pleasure. The preceding interview was pre-recorded at Studio CAL in Halifax. I hope you've enjoyed my talk with Patrick Murray. You've learned a little about him and his music. This program has been sponsored by Amherst Auto Supply, your local Napa Auto Parts store located at 63 South Albion Street. I've been your host, Cal Lewis. You've been listening to interviews in Cal's Closet here on CFTA 107.9.